All right. So, hi everyone. Um, as we all get used to the working from home situation and the whole uh, Corona thing, um, a bit of uh, uh, I'm sorry about section. If you hear uh, children's uh, play around or if you hear all kinds of noises, sorry, <laughs> nothing I can really do about it, but um, I'll try to be uh, um, to talk clearly and to get my message across. And if anyone has uh, any questions, then I'll be happy to answer those. So um, a bit about me. Um, a father of two, uh, I'm the CTO and co-founder of Neurolegion. Um, I'm a DevSecOps uh, enthusiast. I love open source. Uh, by the way, about the Magen application, amazing. The moment I saw that it was open source, um, I was really proud um, being uh, an Israeli and having the government uh, create such uh, an amazing app very soon and really pushing it to GitHub with MIT license. That was amazing. Um, I'm a hardcore Linux user, and yeah, I use Arch. <laughs> um, I've been doing cybersecurity researching for something like 15 years, basically breaking stuff over IRC. Um, I've been a developer for a bit more than six years, um, played around in IT for eight years, uh, and I played around with DevOps. And if you want to hear me rant about all kinds of things or just share interesting tweets, then you can follow me on uh, Twitter at uh, Baraki. Um, so this talk uh, that we're going to have today is about business logic vulnerabilities, um, the difference between standard vulnerabilities, and of course, um, why and how can we automate that? So before we begin, I really want to set a terminology. Um, what is a business logic vulnerability? So when we speak about business logic vulnerability, and we're going to have a slide specifically for that, but there are a lot of different concept, uh, concepts and conceptions and ideas about what exactly is a business logic vulnerability. And to be honest, that's part of the problem in automating that, but again, we'll get there shortly. Um, so what is a business logic vulnerability? Let's take one example uh, and consider it. We're on a website, um, let's say eBay, Amazon. We want to um, buy a few things and um, we're adding a few items to our cart and go into the checkout. But one minute before we press the checkout, we just remember that we promised uh, Ori uh, to buy him a new scarf. All right, so we want to be very uh, good friends with Ori. So we go back um, to the item selection and we're adding a new scarf. Going back to uh, the checkout, we suddenly notice that even though that we have this new scarf in our items, um, the total that we need to pay um, hasn't changed. Now, some will say this is a bug. Some will say this is a vulnerability. The CISO will most likely say this is a vulnerability, and of course the developers will say it's a bug, but in the end, that's a business logic vulnerability. Why? Because no one thought about a situation where um, after calculating the total once, someone will add another item, uh, either in a new tab or uh, even just going back and forth, but that creates an interesting scenario that hasn't been thought of and has security-based um, uh, security impacts. Now, why is it harder to catch than a classic vulnerability? So let's say we're looking for an SQL injection. We don't really need to work that hard, right? Um, we just go, even if we really want to go um, deep and have a huge coverage, We'll just go with um, each and every parameter, go each value and just um, try to inject our token or our payload. Um, that may succeed or may not, but it's very easy to verify, right? We injected our payload. Do we see any kind of SQL, uh, SQL errors being reflected? Do we get some kind of a sleep action going on? But in the end, there is a predefined scenario 
we don't care if the parameter is a phone number, if the parameter is a user ID. Um, we don't care if you're in a cart or a shopping uh, website or we don't care. It's one predefined scenario for one specific test. And this is why it's much harder to get uh, and find uh, business logic vulnerabilities than standard classic vulnerabilities. Because you need to take into consideration the context. Um, so let's talk a bit about um, why it can't be, oh, sorry, uh, why it can't be automated. Um, so, there are different, I think one of the uh, most, uh, uh, sorry, I think one over, ah, all right, yeah, very good, my bad. <laughs> uh, all right, so why it can't be automated? So, uh, you can see in our very cute me that uh, um, from one side, uh, you inputted uh, minus one, um, and uh, saying that minus one is not a business logic vulnerability, but uh, on the other hand, uh, if I right now use that minus one to extract all the Bitcoins from an exchange, for example, then, all right, we still got your Bitcoins. Um, what's the point here? The point here is that um, defining exactly what a business logic uh, vulnerability is or what isn't, is something that is very uh, hard to do. For example, um, most of you, I guess, will agree that my cart uh, checkout scenario was a business logic vulnerability. You know, it's a no-brainer. But let's take uh, a look at the um, lower left part uh, of the screen, the checkout call. So in the end, when I do my request, uh, I send something like that to the server. Uh, giving it some kind of an array with the items they want to buy and uh, the total that um, that I got. Some of you would say that if I can change the total here, um, that means that um, it's just an injection here, or maybe not even an injection, just some kind of a, a client-side issue because the server doesn't store um, doesn't store the information uh, on its side, and um, maybe it's not a business uh, business logic vulnerability. But when we look at it from afar or one step back, and we actually look at the whole picture, that we understood the con con uh, context and that we um, manipulated the context to our advantage, then that's business logic vulnerability. And that's one of the uh, problems in automating that. There are many different definitions. It's difficult to generalize. Um, saying, all right, so or we got one example that we're happy with, uh, this uh, shopping cart. But how do we take this logic of adding items and going to verify the total in the checkout to something like a bank or something like um, a health care provider? There, there is no... Um, there is no relevance between one case to the other. So it's very hard to create one generalized logic to really, um, to really reuse over and over to create automation. Now, uh, another point is that uh, a lot of uh, experts in the field say that um, to detect uh, business logic, you need human smarts, or basically you need a human to look, understand context, and then react on that context to understand how to manipulate and abuse the system. And of course, uh, it requires, requires understanding of the correct flow of the system. So if I don't know how the system should behave, then getting into a situation where the system behaves uh, in a non-standard way, or I manage to trick the system, is something that I can't do unless I know how the system uh, actually works. Um, so that's one part of automation that's also really hard to achieve, because that means that we need to have some kind of a full documentation or a full knowledge of each and every uh, application that we're going to test. Um, and then, and only then, 
we can actually uh, test for what's not standard, what behaves differently. So what are the missing pieces to achieve automation? One is, of course, flow-based attacks, uh, uh, flow attack surface analysis. So understanding that we're not only talking about um, parameters and parameters values, in, like our SQL injection example. It's not about um, finding all the parameters and know how to inject each and every one of those. It's about understanding the flow being used. For example, we have a form that we need to fill. All right, it could be a contact us, it could be a register, um, it could be all kinds of things. But in the end, there is some kind of um, logic being made here. We, as a human, can read something and react to it, but an automated mis machine can't do that. Um, the other thing is, of course, um, context-driven uh, context testing methodology. Um, that really uh, connects with the uh, former point about what's the right way to um, browse the target, or at least the right way to um, react to the flow. Um, do we go to this page first, and then do we get to that page? Do we need to fill this form and then go and fill this other form? Do we have a multi-step selection? Do we have all kinds of logics that are very obvious for us humans, but are very hard to um, generalize in code form. Um, of course, we need um, real, real-time response uh, understanding. That means not just uh, analyzing the uh, response statuses uh, um, to analyze or regex the body, but really get an understanding about what's the difference between this response and this response. Um, all right. The body is different. They have different um, HTTP codes. But but what's, what is the difference? Um, is this one a failure? And if so, why did it fail? Is this one a success? And if so, um, where are we now? Where do we go to? And the last thing, and that's um, something that's very relevant, is you need a lot of data. And really, I mean a lot. Um, trying to generalize something like that means you need some kind of a, of a sample and a deep analysis sample from multiple applications. And I'm talking about tens of thousands of them uh, for the first stage, because only then you can really start to create the similarities, filter out the similarities, and start building links between, uh, between them. So, Let's see what happens um, when we just try to attack in the classic way. So it doesn't really matter uh, what our um, what our transport logic or transport technology is. Let's say we have an XML or a JSON, and uh, we want to inject uh, an SQL query. We don't care what's there. We just want to add to that or replace that with our uh, SQL injection. I don't care about um, the value being a phone uh, phone number. I don't care if it's a string of, or an integer. It doesn't matter to me. If the uh, target value uh, of that parameter is being saved unsanitized into the database of the application, that's it, right? And then I know what, how to behave and what to expect. Now, what if we don't want to just inject an SQL injection? Let's say in that application, the developer did an amazing job. Every input um, is secured. You can't inject anything. And not even that, the developer was um, very happy that he added some kind of um, protection there, multi-factor authentication or just a more secured flow. Instead of putting a username, right now we're putting uh, our, uh, sorry, instead of putting a password, we will put our username and then a phone number and then we'll get the OTP. Sounds legit. Now, the problem is that uh, the server 
doesn't save this information, but gets it from the user. Uh, if we try SQL injections, if we try any of the classic uh, attacks on that, it won't work. But what if we take a step back, look at the situation, and use our uh, human smarts to try and understand what's going on? So we're giving the server a phone number, all right? Um, what if I can change the phone number and the username and then uh, get back the OTP to my phone, but to whoever uh, user I want to log in as? So just by understanding that there is a difference between um, different parameters, and that's taking into consideration both names and values and types, um, I can get much more uh, a much broader attack surface and also be actual, actually getting the possibility to analyze and do a business logic based attack because I can see farther. I know it's not just, just this one parameter, it's just this one value. It's a whole flow. Now, all right. Right, we get the issue. We understand why automating uh, the business logic detections and why it's really hard um, to automate. But how do we automate, right? This talk is about automation of uh, business logic vulnerabilities. So what do we do? Of course, um, if uh, any of you weren't sleeping in a cave uh, since 2015, then you heard about um, AI, machine learning, and all that buzz. Um, so we created uh, some kind of uh, uh, experiment using those technologies to automate business logic vulnerability detection. Now, the reason I'm going with AI here and not machine learning, and yes, AI is that our uh, very esteemed uh, uh, chief scientist uh, told me that um, NLP specifically is not under machine learning, it's under AI. It's a different branch. So we're going to be uh, right with our terminology. It's not a buzzword. We're actually talking about AI here. So what different um, technologies did we use? Uh, for those experiments. So first of all, genetic algorithms, decision trees, reinforcement learning, natural language processing, and uh, a bit more. Now, there is a link here um, that goes into an open source project that we've been working on for, I think, around two years, maybe a bit more, that has most of uh, our uh, most of our understandings, ideas, and innovation uh, in an open source way that can allow each and every one of you to um, play around with uh, with the algorithms, with uh, different um, different uh, data sets, and try to see what can you what you can achieve. Um, so I'm going to share that afterwards as well. But keep in mind that. Um, that you have that here. So um, now let's see a bit of a demo. Um, sadly, this demo is a video. Uh, so I'll try to show it um, via the screen share, but if anyone has an issue, just let me know. Um, sorry. All right. So. Our target is a Bitcoin uh, exchange. Uh, in this case, the uh, fuzzing engine that uses the, uh, the algorithms run and try to find some kind of a vulnerability. We still don't know which vulnerability because uh, nothing is very defined in the sense of business logic. Uh, vulnerabilities. We don't have, uh, again, it's not like SQL injection that we can just say, all right, do I see any kind of a, a problematic response? But it's more about making the system do something unexpected, making it uh, behave differently. So uh, the fuzzer started running, uh, just generating random data. It knows that it should be an integer because of uh, uh, analysis. 
and it gets to uh, some kind of an input, uh, trying to play around and then running NLP and that. Uh, specifically, the response says the uh, the amount of uh, uh, the amount that you're trying to withdraw uh, is basically more than what you have, uh, is more than you currently have. Um, using context analysis, in this case, NLP on the whole page, we know that we, uh, you can see on the uh, upper right side, we have zero Bitcoins available. So we know that, that we co it's more than what we currently have and we currently have zero. So, all right, let's try and put zero. Um, that's also the logic of the fuzzer. Um, using that, it really reacts um, to what the uh, server or the application tells it and reruns the analysis, amount must be, must be greater than zero. NLP, the most basic uh, phrases, um, what, makes, uh, what makes it obvious for us also makes it obvious for the engine. Um, must be greater than, that's math. <laughs> So we know it has to be larger than the zero, but um, we know that uh, uh, that it has to be lower than one. So more than zero, lower than one, decimal points. Um, using a predefined uh, range attack behavior, it, under it goes into the median and deep into the median trying to produce some kind of an unexpected behavior, running uh, deeper, deeper, um, generating uh, more and more payloads, just following the same logic until it detects some kind of a different uh, behavior. In this case, a baseline deviation. So the uh, system reacts uh, in one way, then it reacts totally differently. And uh, we know that we broke something or that we achieved a new, uh, a new branch. And that's something that we can automate. The next example. Um, in this case, uh, something a bit uh, more interesting, I think. Um, we saw an application that generates a PDF, uh, PDF uh, report. Uh, you give it two dates. Uh, from to and then it generates this PDF uh, with an entry for each hour of every day. Um, the fuzzer using again uh, NLP uh, detected that first of all using a very standard um, uh, regex and structure analysis, it understood that there is a date object. All right, we get a date object, and running NLP, it understood that there is a range. So. Um, we know that there is a range. We know that the uh, value of this range is playing between two dates. And then we know how to, uh, how to classify what's going on, the context. We decided, or the father automatically decided to um, go into its range logic attacks. In this case, not going for the median, but going to on a uh, range extension. In this case, extending the range and uh, taking the date from 1,000 years to the past. This uh, obviously created a denial of service uh, attack against the target, um, which tried to create a few uh, terabytes of PDF, uh, all with images, footers, and, you know. Um, it's an interesting finding because if you look at it specifically, it's just I don't know, uh, playing with dates, but actually automating that, um, understanding the context is what's interesting. So what's next? Uh, or where do we want to take this experiment further? Of course, uh, we want to add more and more generic cases. The generic cases are range attacks, um, are uh, add more items, duplicate items, all kinds of things that we can really add that uh, after that will be um, can be used generically just because it's a very general concept. The other thing is to add more type detections. We know that we have the phone numbers, we know that we have uh, UUIDs and emails, and we know that we have um, integers, but there are more there are more structures, there are more types, and the more 
we can add and analyze, the more we can actually abuse. And the third point is, of course, uh, unleash that on the unaware population and, uh, you know, burst Skynet. But uh, um, putting jokes aside, uh, that's where we're going to take that. And uh, if anyone wants to jump on the uh, uh, Shinet project, they're more than happy to play around with it and uh, share with us what they found. Um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, you know, stay safe with all the Corona things. And uh, I hope you enjoyed my talk.